features it this year, but we're we're trying our best. Good morning to those in America. Uh, good afternoon to Europe and Africa. Good evening to those in the Asia Pacific region. Welcome to this open forum on how COVID-19 can help us prepare for a sustainability transition. My name is Stephen McGreevy. I'm based in Japan at the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature. And I'll just go around quickly to the five other hosts of tonight's open forum. There's Maury Cohen from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Yep. Joe Sarkis from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. You said it well, Stephen. Thank you. Good, I got it. Paul DeWick from the Manchester Metropolitan University and University of Manchester. Good afternoon, everybody. Great. Patrick Schroeder at Chatham House in the UK. Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for joining this webinar. Great. And Magnus Bengtsson, who is a freelance researcher and consultant in Japan as well. Thank you, Stephen. Hello, everyone. Great. Joe, hit me with the slide there. Okay. Okay, so Maury, Patrick, Magnus, and I are part of the management team for the Systems of Sustainable Consumption and Production, SCP for short, Knowledge Action Network. And Joe and Paul are part of the working group on circular economy. All of this is under the umbrella of Future Earth, which is an international research program which aims to build knowledge about the environmental and human aspects of global change and to find solutions for sustainable development. Our Knowledge Action Network, or CAN, K-A-N, tries to bridge the worlds of research and scholarly work with action and practice to work on issues related to sustainable consumption and production. We have working groups on the political economy of SCP, SCP in cities, social change beyond consumerism, communicating for SCP, global value chains, and the circular economy. This open forum is organized and sponsored by Future Earth, by the SCP CAN, and the Taylor and Francis Journal Sustainability, Science, Practice, and Policy. Um, I'm wondering if Amy Lures is on the call. Amy, are you on the call? Amy Lures is the Future Earth uh, Executive Director. Um, once she shows up, I think we'll send over to her and she might uh, have a few things to say. Um, I don't if you'd see like her, to learn Stephen. more, I don't, yeah, I don't see, see her, her on the. It's okay. We'll get her when she's on. Um, if you want to learn more about Future Earth, as well as the Knowledge Action Network on, sustainable, uh, on systems of sustainable consumption and production, uh, you can do so at the website Future Earth one word, dot org. Next slide. Okay. So this is the program for how we'd like to proceed for the day. Um, after I go over some housekeeping items, three of the hosts are going to offer some very brief thoughts. Oh, Stephen, if I could post. break in, Amy, Amy's arrived. Oh, fantastic. Amy, can you unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please? Yes. Hello, Great. everybody. Amy Lures. Go ahead. Uh, apologies. Uh, I, um, I was on another meeting, and I was, I've been very much looking forward to this discussion, so apologies for coming late. Um, I'm Amy Lures. I'm the executive director of Future Earth, which, um, for those of you who don't know Future Earth, we're an international network of researchers uh, collaborating to advance the um, global sustainability agenda. And I'm thrilled to be for this, um, for the uh, Knowledge Action uh, Sustainable Systems um, Consumption and Production Systems uh, Knowledge Action Network to be leading this discussion. And I'm and, um, happy to engage and hear, uh, learn from all of you. I also wanted to flag that um, uh, Maury and some others uh, in our group are, um, going to be pulling out a survey uh, quickly, which will be um, hopefully coming out tomorrow, that will really touch on trying to get a broader grasp of people's thinking around these same very issues. And, um, and so I, we, we will, you will be getting that. I hope that you will participate in that and that can feed into the discussions that we're having here. 
I think it's a really important time, of course, as we all know. I hope everybody is healthy and um, uh, and and safe. Um, and uh, and I think we have to be delicate about this conversation, but it is in you know in an unprecedented time where we need to think big, but think carefully about where we go. So thank you to all of you for leading this discussion, and um, and uh, and I encourage you all to to continue the discussion and and hopefully do take the survey that we will send out um, to tomorrow uh, or or very soon. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, that was Amy Lures, the Future Earth Executive Director. And if you want to learn more about Future Earth, go to futureearth.org. Okay, let's go to the next slide. One back there, Joe. There we go. So this is the program, uh, how we'd like to proceed for today. Um, after I go over some housekeeping items, three of the hosts are going to offer some very brief thoughts taken from the blog post to introduce some topics for discussion and pose some questions to the group. And once we've gone through these top talks, we're gonna open up the virtual floor to discussion. Um, so please post on the onlinequestions.org page that uh, was mentioned in the last email to everybody. And you can upvote questions and comments that you like so that we can better facilitate the discussion. So we'd like to discuss as long as possible, but in the final 10 minutes or so of the forum, we'd like to shift gears and ask for offers and also what we're calling asks or needs. Um, do you have anything to offer the group in terms of an opportunity, maybe organizing a follow-up webinar or leading a writing project? Um, or have you uh, identified a need that you'd like uh, to ask the larger group if they'd like to help out with? Uh, post those in the same onlinequestions.org page, uh, light blue for offers and dark blue for asks. We'll try to facilitate the necessary connections for those after the webinar. So move on to the, web the housekeeping announcements, please, Joe. Great. First um, on the list, if you have your name, if everybody can double check your name that you've written in the Zoom participant list, if you can rename yourself to a name that uh, we can all sort of recognize, there might be a lot of people with the same name on the call uh, that would help. Um, when we first had the idea to host this open forum on this topic, we anticipated maybe hearing from 30 or 40 people who might be interested in having a chat, but little did we know that over 500 people would sign up. Um, so our, our interaction uh, will have to be a bit more structured than we anticipated, but that's, I hope that that's okay. Um, and we hope that the setup that we have will work out for everyone to get their views voiced and give as many of us a chance to speak and join the discussion. Um, another kind of standard etiquette that uh, we'd like to follow on the call is just to have your microphones on mute and your cameras off unless you've been identified to speak. Um, at that time, when you've been invited to talk, just unmute and go ahead. Uh, normally, I could um, kind of manage all this, but with so many participants, it might be kind of difficult. Um, also, try to identify yourself when you, when you uh, have a chance to speak so we all kind of can know who is with us. Um, and also try to keep your comments and questions short and concise so we can allow others to join the conversation. Um, this version of Zoom is, a, is set up as a massive online meeting, which doesn't allow for a smooth Q&A session with like upvoting of questions, etc. cetera. Um, and so for the discussion portion of the forum, we're gonna use a free website called onlinequestions.org. Think of it as a massive chat box. It was in the second email that was sent around with the links uh, for tonight. And I'm just gonna post it. I think people have been posting it in the uh, chat box. Uh, all you need to do is click on the link, go to onlinequestions.org, enter the event number, which is 33333, that's five threes in the audience member box and click enter. And there are a number of ways you can contribute. For the first part of the webinar, please contribute by making comments using the yellow cards 
and by asking questions using the green cards. And remember to write your name somewhere in the comment or question card if you want to speak. Um, there's not a lot of people that are writing their names. There's a lot of questions um, at the last moment when I was checking. So please put your names on there so we can sort of identify you to contribute to the discussion. Um, and you can also upvote uh, by clicking on different cards that you'd like to be discussed. Okay. Um, we also invite you to make offers and asks. I just talked about this. If you're in a position to make an offer, for example, a research funding opportunity, use the light blue cards and ask, use the dark blue cards uh, for help to uh, engage on something in the future. We're gonna use the final 10 minutes or so for that, but you can go ahead and, and, and start putting those in at the moment right now. If you can't use the online questions website, don't worry, please put your contributions in the Zoom chat box and we'll try to transfer these uh, across for you. Um, please begin your message with comment, question, offer, or ask, and that'll kind of help us with sorting. Um, with so many participants, uh, it might be kind of difficult if a whole bunch of people all of a sudden at once go for it. So uh, just be patient. We're also gonna be recording the open forum and posting it online for those who couldn't make it today. And we'll be downloading the questions and comments from the chat boxes. Um, this content will sort of digest over the next week or so and get back to everyone in due course on ways we might follow up together from this gathering. So a couple more things for me and then I will shut up. Um, basically, um, on March 13th, uh, my colleagues and I wrote this blog post for the uh, Future Earth website on the topic of tonight's open forum. And this was really written in the early days before the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be pandemic and the truly global proportions of the situation became apparent. Um, we extend our deepest sympathies to colleagues on the front lines of the outbreak and to people who have suffered losses and to everyone subjugated to or subjected to profound uh, disruptions in their daily lives. And we also recognize um, that the authors of the blog and conveners of tonight's open forum are all white males. I saw some folks in the chat box already mentioned this. This was sort of just an unfortunate outcome of how this group came together on the fly. Um, part of the reason to hold an open forum like this is to reach out to a diverse group of people interested in these issues and to work together. Uh, without question, uh, the world after COVID-19 will be a changed one. And the goal of this open forum is to explore together how to navigate and leverage these changes to open pathways to sustainability transition. I think that's why we've all gathered online today. And we're not here to lecture. We don't have all the answers or perhaps any uh, answers, uh, but this is just really a chance to jumpstart a conversation together and to follow up in the future. And that's it for me. Um, thank you so much. We'll pass it on to Maury Cohen from uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology for the first talk. Thanks. All right, great, Cedar, thank you. Thank you very much, you hear me okay? No problem. Yes. Okay, all right, so um, uh, first slide, Steve, uh, Joe. Uh, I'm, deep, I'm deeply grateful for the presence of all of you here today. Um, many on the call have long recognized that progress in terms of sustainability would be achievable either by design or by disaster. Um, to our great misfortune, um, there's unfortunately not been sufficient enthusiasm in the wider world over recent decades for the design option um, to play itself out. So now we find ourselves in the disaster scenario. Um, few of us ever imagined that we would be looking into the eye of a cold stop shutdown of significant parts of the global economy um, and for an indefinite period of time. Um, we didn't aspire to this future, um, nor do we find it acceptable. While some in this community have given thought to the implications of severe resource shortages, protracted military conflicts, and other exigencies, I'm not aware of anyone who's modeled the impacts of a deadly pandemic on a sustainability transition, yet that's where we now find ourselves. 
A small group of us, as Stephen indicated, wrote a short essay a couple of weeks ago, just as the COVID outbreak was taking hold in Italy and starting to show itself in the US elsewhere beyond China. Uh, turns out that we lacked sufficient vision because after the passage of just a few days, virtually everything that we discussed had already come to pass. Um, next slide, please, Joe. A couple of the points that we made. Uh, we talked about scaling back of working hours and the likely institutionalization of changes in employment routines. Um, that's already occurred. Uh, second, we outlined the necessity, indeed the inevitability of a universal basic income. And many countries are already moving in that direction, at least on a provisional basis. Uh, third, we described how commuting to and from work would be replaced by video conferencing, both in the short term and perhaps in the long term as well. That outcome has been achieved already and likely will be an enduring change that will persist into the future. Um, we're familiar with the notion of digital nomads, but in just a few days, an entire generation of digital homads has been launched. Fourth, our essay described how we would see a deep contraction in retail purchases. While there's been the anticipated stockpiling in recent weeks, we're now witnessing what some have described as a destruction of demand. Finally, and perhaps most ambitiously, we speculated that the COVID pandemic would mark the end of gross domestic product as a metric of any consequence. We're looking at economic contractions of 30% and perhaps significantly larger if current lockdowns extend beyond the currently anticipated period. Already seeing, we're already seeing efforts in the United States to suppress unemployment data. This is the first step. GDP is, effectively speaking, dead. What politician is going to want to wrap themselves in such singularly depressing data? Next slide, Joe, please. As Stephen indicated, we've purposefully not designed this session as a platform for self-appointed experts to forecast what may or may not occur in the months and years ahead. It would, I think, be counterproductive to spend a lot of time here talking about specific strategies and policy opportunities in one country, city, or another. Next slide, please, Joe. Uh, better to my mind to devote ourselves to considering how the fundamental cultural, cultural political narrative of our times is inevitably going to change in perhaps radical ways. As systems theorist Danella Meadows might have said, if she were here with us today, we will face moments that offer the potential of extraordinary leverage. The days of neoliberal competition, unfettered globalization, policy marketization, crony capitalism have very likely reached their end in spectacular fashion. Next slide, please, Joe. Uh, proposals that were well beyond, the, well, but well outside the mainstream are now suddenly either racing into place or on the table nationalization of key industries, municipal ownership, and cooperativism at significant scale, just to name a few. Next slide, please. Many of us gathered here, to, <coughs> excuse me. Many of us are gathered here today. <coughs> Many of us gathered here today are interested in one way or another in systems of consumption and production. Next slide. We can debate the finer points but let me suggest here that the organization of work determines the organization of consumption. As such, I think it behooves us to recognize that one of the medium term consequences of COVID-19 is likely to be an unprecedented rush to digital automation in the workplace. The shift to telecommuting and video conferencing is probably just a short term adjustment that will give way probably quite quickly. Over the next few months, with people tethered to their workplaces from home via the internet, managers will come to recognize that they can move in the direction of what some of our colleagues have referred to as full automation, the antithesis of full employment. Next slide. So we face a future of profound uncertainty and danger. 
especially in countries that don't have a very good track record of looking after ordinary people under duress. I know that it's sometimes challenging to have a conversation about global economic restructuring while hundreds of people are dying with each passing day and many more are severely ill. However, if we wait too long to begin this conversation, it will be too late. Though the events are not directly comparable, that is the lesson of the 2008 financial crisis. And let us remember that the design plan for the post-World War II fin uh, financial and economic system was hammered out more than a year before the end of the actual war. Last slide, please, Joe. So that's the full sum of what I have to say here today. I thank you for taking a bit of your time from your hectic, chaotic schedules these days and nights to join in this discussion. And I'll pass the baton to my colleague, uh, Magnus. Thank you, Maureen. And once again, hello to everyone. Thank you for joining our forum here today. And I look forward to the to the discussion that will follow uh, our introductory remarks here. Um, so in today's open forum, we are sharing with you some initial thoughts that we have on what this pandemic could, could uh, what could be the legacy of the current COVID pandemic and how this great tragedy that we know unfortunately have to live through, live through how this could affect our society over the, the longer term. So, this question has attracted a lot of attention in recent, in recent weeks. And uh, I put on this slide just a few headings that appeared in my news feed uh, to illustrate that, that there is so much thinking and, and discussion going on around this topic. And uh, we think it's important to connect the dots here and to, to catalyze action out of all this, this thinking and discussion. Um, but the, in this forum, we want to explore more specifically, as Maurice said before here, how this crisis could change the ways that we, that we organize work, and how, and the way we uh, produce and consume goods and services in society. And I think the overarching framing question that we want to, to address here is, is there a possibility that this global trauma that we are facing here could, could actually help us accelerate uh, the much needed transition to a more sustainable civilization and more sustainable ways of living. Um, so those of us here in the group that organizing that are organizing this open forum, as Stephen said before, certainly we don't pretend to have all the answers here. Um, I think it's honest to say that we have few answers to, to offer. And at this point in time, I think it's the most useful thing we can do is to try to formulate good questions. Um, and that's what we are hoping to be able to do here with you today and to generate uh, a rich set of ideas down the line on actions that could be taken to make sure that, that the right lessons are learned from the, the crisis that we are going through. So we hope, hoping that the conversation we are having here today can be the starting point for a joint exploration and that you will, uh, many of you will decide to join us in this effort. So when we are talking about the societal change related to, to the pandemic, um, we can think about different time frames, and um, we have identified three different relevant time frames. First, in the middle of this trauma and the negative disruption that we see happening, there are some changes that are positive from an environmental perspective. Magnus. Hmm. We have lost I Magnus. Think, I think we've lost Magnus. Okay. Do you want me to begin well, my slides? Why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Okay. I'll share my slides. We'll come back to Magnus to, for him to uh, complete. Magnus, are you back? Uh, yeah. I can hear myself, but oh. can you hear me? Please go. Now you're uh, back. Yes. I'm back. Go ahead, okay. Magnus. Yep. Okay. Yeah, of course. So the, these changes that we are seeing with teleworking, uh, virtual interaction, um, and also a drop in air travel. We see that many cities have better air quality now than they have had a, in a long, long time. We see a drop in greenhouse gas emission. Some of these things will go back to normal. 
um, other things might stay. But is there something that we can do deliberately to try to lock in some of these environmental gains? That's one thing that we can, can consider. And second, um, we also need to consider uh, the longer term consequences of what governments are already doing now, pumping in money in the form of stimulus packages and taking other actions. Uh, what would be the, the longer lasting effects of that? How will that shape our consumption and production patterns over the coming years. And uh, third and final point, um, the longer term and more transformative changes um, that are still just presenting themselves as opportunities. Um, as Mori hinted at, that some things that looked uh, very utopian and uh, uh, too radical to, to, to be um, seen as, as realistic, just a few weeks ago, um, it's now already happening and people are talking about them uh, as something that's, that's actually uh, fully feasible and desirable. Um, we see, I think we see an, op an opening in what some people refer to as the Overton window, the universe of ideas that are considered um, realistic. And um, this shift is, is, uh, offers a profound opportunity for sustainability advocates. Um, some of us may wish to use that label. Um, but in the aftermath of this crisis, uh, there will be lots of pressure on politicians to help society to go back to normal, to prop up old industries and to lift stock markets. Um, there will be a lot of contest contestation uh, and uh, people will uh, draw different lessons from the pandemic and offer different ways forward. And we need to be active in these discussions. We need to be prepared um, to mobilize people, to mobilize good ideas, and to, uh, to, to be ready to do clever advocacy. So uh, building strong coalitions um, among different groups so let's join forces and try to hammer out some good strategies on what we can, how we can, can use this unfortunate crisis as, uh, as, as a starting point for something useful. So thank you so much. And uh, over to uh, Joe, right? Okay, thank you, Magnus. We'll go back to the slides now. Apologies to those who did not realize that we were going away from slides back to this. Okay. Um, so far, what we've spoken about has been around the broader social consumption side. And my part in this is to speak a little bit about the um, sustainable production side, because we are the SSCP, P stands for the production. So from the production perspective, I have four major points that I'd like to make very quickly, if possible. Um, we need to revisit how we manage our supply chains, and this includes the sustainability aspect of it. The technology does play a role. Um, of course, there's gonna be questions and there's some controversy associated with it, but it can play a role in helping us transition if it's done right. Uh, a brief mention of the, some social innovations, a couple of social innovations. And um, my one of the takeaways here is that the sustainability outcomes may be negative or positive, and I'll just touch on a couple points and they're very general points at this time. So first of all, the some crisis observations, we've heard about the supply chain and the vulnerability of the over-reliance on just-in-time delivery, a efficiency-based supply chain, um, and some of the weaknesses, the poor resilience have been observed. And the lesson that we have learned, at least in the initial portions of this, and maybe lessons that will be carried on later, our supply chains need to be more robust and resilient. Now, there is ways of making them more robust and resilient and redundancy is an example, building excess capacity, but it also may mean greater uh, waste and materials that are stored in different places. So it's not necessarily a positive from that aspect of sustainability. But the other aspect of this is that the global supply chain, especially what began in China and actually goes to the rest of the world are part of the fragility of the situation different regions of the world. So to rely on specific regions of the world may be a bit risky and building a more robust supply chain means 
focusing on various regions of the world. So some of the things that may be occurring and could be occurring is localized, a greater role for localized supply chains with global linkages, something called globalization, where maybe some commodities are, are shipped from global locations, especially rare commodities, where most of the operations occur locally. And of course, when you have local supply chains, um, there's energy savings, there's material uses, foliage issues uh, are reduced. So in the local um, efforts, there is a chance to bring some additional sustainability. Uh, the other part of this is the less of a pipeline, that is less of a length of time for products to go through means less inventory, which again means a little less materials, which may offset some of the um, issues of having a distributed uh, supply chain and resilient robust system. And the offsets may, by, may be by extra inventory at dispersed redundant locations. So this is where the balance might be between those that are more sustainable, at least um, materials, energy, and less sustainable by holding additional materials and um, energy for the locations. Now the technological innovation observations, just some very general ones here. I have put together a listing of about uh, 10, 15 of these, and I'll only share three of them. So there's many more issues and many more um, concerns related to technological innovation. But one of the things that has been in the news lately is this additive 3D manufacturing, which can provide localized and flexible production. Um, for example, there's been 3D manufacturing for ventilators and other parts, and this was ramped up very quickly because of the flexibility of this technology. And part of this, from a supply chain perspective and a production perspective, is it shortens the supply chain. There's less energy usage and emissions um, for delivering items. Of course, you still need some of the raw materials to be delivered, but the actual items, you only produce what you need when you need it. And that's part of the inventory um, management aspect of it. Another technological innovation observation are robotics and cyber physical systems. Um, in response to social distancing, for example, we become more common, we are more comfortable working further away. And that would be a situation where more um, energy may be used locally in operations, but not necessarily you have to travel to do the work. And this is a little bit of a behavioral thing. So the less travel to work requirement when you have distant robotics and cyber physical systems that can be done remotely from the, the systems. Um, it can be very flexible and produce many different products. As we know, the changeover aspects is a big issue right now, but learning from these changeover aspects can also occur for almost any products in the future where there's an emergency need um, and this gets into the social sustainability, there might also be more efficient utilization of resources. Now, from an information perspective, we have blockchain, the Internet of Things, and sensor technologies that can help in the reduction. You could trace products and materials. You could do a better control of this. Maybe there's some pilots going on and technology that we're learning right now from a blockchain perspective, which is you have distributed databases that everybody can see and share. Once you have this, for example, the ventilator concern that New York has right now is where are the ventilators? What if we had these types of controls for almost any resource that we needed at um, a later time? Um, and you could link some of this blockchain internet of things of tracing materials to stuff, to um, practices such as the circular economy, which we'll come back to as well. And we also have the concern here, a negative concern, is that the energy requirements for some of these could be very large. Again, we need to balance what might work, what may not work. Um, and this is part of the studies that we could do at later stages to determine has sustainability gone down with these innovations and these new technologies. Now, some of the socioeconomic innovations that we could point to, of course, are circular economy principles, because I'm part of the circular economy con, that um, this is a, a, an important concern. And what you have there is you have materials already in the local economy. Maybe localized resources from a circular economy can be reused for other resources with the other technologies as well. The other aspect of a socioeconomic innovation is the sharing economy, which we are all familiar with as well. Helping each other out when we can help each other out. For example, right now, truckers with excess capacity are delivering groceries 
And I just saw something the other day where uh, truckers for an, um, a cable company or electric company was actually shipping groceries because they did not need to ship other products and materials. So there's that sharing economy idea. And then you get into the broader perspective that now trucks can be used for multiple aspects, not just for the specific aspect of your, that your company needs. And coopetition of especially the transportation logistics. So that was a very quick overview. There's many more dimensions. Um, and I just put these as con conversation starters. There's probably a million conversation starters. I probably don't need to go over these. So why don't I just give the, um, the podium back to Steve to take over. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Maury, Magnus, and Joe for those great talks to sort of give us something to chew on as we open up the virtual floor to discussion. Um, I'm looking at the onlinequestions.org page and it's amazing. There's so many cards, questions, comments on here, and everyone is upvoting those. Um, continue to do so as we discuss. Um, we've been trying to pick out kind of the, the key sort of interesting questions and comments from the bunch. And I'll be calling on those of you out there to sort of uh, comment a bit or, 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 or get the discussion going a bit. Um, as we go forward. Just a quick reminder, keep your comments short if possible. I mean, 30 seconds is a little bit too short, maybe but about 30 seconds to a minute maximum. Um, state your name and affiliation so we can all kind of know who's online with us. And then, um, as I just mentioned, go to the onlinequestions.org page, event number 33333, that's five threes, or just type in some questions in the chat box as well. So I'm gonna go over to the first uh, question and comment that we gathered from the group there. Philip Vergrat, could you please uh, uh, say a few words, turn on your microphone and your video if you might. And <clears throat> you had a question about locking in lifestyle changes. Yeah. And, uh, a so hello everybody. Didn't increase well -being. Go ahead. Yeah, hello everybody, and thank you for organizing this. This is great, and and great to see so many familiar faces and names. So um, I was looking around and see all these people who are stuck at home and are reinventing how to uh, how to have a good life on a very limited uh, area, uh, going back to playing games with each other or, or instructing their children or helping their neighbors out. And so there is a whole bunch of new um, um, ways of well-being that, and the question of course is, uh, how can we learn from that? How, come, how could this be locked in? Uh, so another question that, that I have is that, um, do, we, do we think that the positive part of this could stick? Or are we going to see a huge rebound of people flying all over the world to sort of catch up for lost time? That is really something. I think I'm out of my 45 seconds. Thank right. you. No, that's a really good point. So discussing the, the idea of how we're reevaluating well-being as we're living these kind of remote or, or homebound uh, lives. Um, let's go on to the next on the list here that I have. Miriam Bodenheimer, uh, would you like to share your ideas on alternative or super economic progress measures in targeted financial aid to facilitate industrial structural change? Miriam, are you there? Yep, one second. Uh, just trying to figure out how to turn on my camera here. Uh, there we go, can you see me? I think you. Should be able to. Something's coming. Great. Yes, we do, Miriam. Let us know. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, perfect. So, Miriam Bodenheimer from the Fraunhofer Easy in Karlsruhe in Germany. Um, we do a lot of work on also technological innovations for sustainability transitions. And uh, my question is basically just there, there will be a lot of financial aid, a lot of um, economic aid packages in the coming months from all sorts of governments. And one of the questions I think we should consider is how can we 
really make sure that that aid and those finances go into sustainable technologies, that we um, use that as an opportunity to really fund new technologies, new systems, new opportunities that also further the sustainability transition. I don't have any solutions to that, to that question, but I think it's something we should really work on and keep in mind. Great. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Miriam. Excellent. And I see some folks are saying these are great questions. Um, and keep participating in the chat box. That's fantastic. Um, the next person I have on the list, Denny, D-E-N-I, um, has posted on the online questions page. Denny, are you there? You talk of incentives and motivations changing during a crisis. Um, what sort of system would you like to live in post COVID-19? Denny, are you there? You there? Maybe Denny's? Doesn't seem like they're on the, on the line, it looks like. Well, that's a good question. It's, uh, it's ranking quite high on the, on the page there. Um, let's go down to Haldra Rogers. Uh, you have a comment about ensuring biodiversity as part of the sustainability transition. Haldra, are you there? Yep, I'm right here. Um, Excellent. Yeah, thank you. I was just at the World Biodiversity Forum, and I, I think often, so, and I'm an ecologist, so I study um, kind of the extinctions, the effect of extinctions on communities, and I feel like often biodiversity is completely left out of a lot of these sustainability transitions, and it's very possible to solve climate change, but at the expense of biodiversity. So I think it's important that we find solutions that not only address climate change and sustainability in a kind of a economic and social sense, but also from an ecological perspective. Um, and with the biggest uh, impact on biodiversity being agricultural land transformation, I think that was a widespread conclusion from the World Biodiversity Forum. So I think that's something we really need to be thinking about. Great. Steve, you're muted. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Haldra, for that on biodiversity. It's very important. Let's go to M. Spiegelberg. I think that's Max. You had a comment on not starting from scratch within alternative practices. Do you have a second to extend your comment? Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, so there has been alternative projects out in the shades, basically, in many countries. Um, uh, attracting a lot of people uh, all over the world and several of those have now a uh, higher demand. I've seen in many countries that uh, uh, vegetable boxes and organic farmers are being overrun uh, at the moment because the general supply doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, support anymore enough food. So, and that has been researched uh, all over the world as well and shown that there's uh, more than just a, a business out there, it's it's also a social and cultural contribution, which I think becomes now more and more valuable in these times and in the future ahead. So I think that part should be emphasized that uh, a transition doesn't start from zero. We are not changing all the way everything, but we are already in some parts there. Just these things have to be amplified and, and made more visible and more mainstream maybe. So it takes a bit of the away, uh, away the pressure, and uh, um, it becomes less scary, I think, for people who who are thinking of, oh no, we are turning everything around. It's maybe not everything, but some of the things need to be turned around a lot, and there are options which which have proven valuable. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's no, really important that uh, some of the local uh, farmers and and folks that are that are still outside of the sort of major uh, supply chains are being inundated now with orders and everything. I've heard about that as well. Rose, Rose from O-S-I-F-E. Are you on the call? Hi, yes, I am. Hi, Perfect. everyone. Um, my name go is ahead. Rose Lundquist. A... I'm go with ahead. the Open Society Foundation Initiative in Europe. And I was just wondering about what is the role for private foundations or uh, philanthropic organizations like mine in pursuing this transition. Thanks. 
Rose. Yeah, I wondered. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Joel. I was going to say, Rose, what do you recommend? How, since you are working with a philanthropic organization, what might you recommend that they can do? So obviously, I think this is the this is the reason why I'm asking about philanthropic entities like OSF, is that there is an ability to act in a way that is perhaps different to that of governments or frontline responders or uh, community organisations, for example. There's a lot of resources and a lot of expertise, but also a lot of influence and a lot of networks that um, private foundations have. And while we're sitting here thinking and designing our COVID responses, and I noticed that someone in the chat box said that private philanthropy appears to have been very silent in, in the crisis. I don't think that's necessarily because nothing's happening. It's because people are trying to work out what to do. And so this is why I'm on this call is to work out what to do and how we can use the resources and um, other things that we have at our disposal to try and make sure that this is a, a we, we do try and shift towards a more positive and uh, alter a systemic alternative rather than going back to business as usual or going backwards, um, especially on, on issues about climate transition after all of this. Yeah. Fantastic, thanks so much, Rose. Again, if you, if you have a, an answer for Rose or, a, or you know, a kind of deep thought, put it into the uh, group chat there um, and she can follow up and we can all kind of follow up. Um, let's go to Adrian Smith. Are you on the call? Can yeah. you please share your reflections on how we can create and maintain space to pause, reflect, and take stock when there are so many actions already going on? Adrian, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you see me? Yeah. Um, yes, we can. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Maybe Magnus answered this already in his presentation, but I mean, and Mary pointed out that, you know, responses to previous crises, there were things to draw on. And Max was saying that. But, but clearly, if, if this crisis now is shifting a lot of our terms of reference, then we have to draw on that in quite careful and thoughtful ways, it seems to me. So we need space to rethink and to pause and reflect. And yet we're also seeing um, uh, different interests, opinions, analyses rushing in to kind of claim and capture the future agenda. Um, some may be in sustainable ways, some deeply um, regressive. Uh, so my question was about how to kind of keep that space open for deliberation and reflection. And Magnus said about, you know, asking the right kinds of questions and thinking about what questions to keep posing. That might be one answer. So we just keep need to ask questions, but maybe people have got other ideas as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adrian. I think um, piggybacking then on this question of reflection and right, asking the right questions, someone had the question, what narratives are needed to use the COVID-19 crisis to accelerate sustainability transitions? We need to have the right kind of story. We didn't have a name associated with this question, but perhaps someone who had this question, what narratives are needed to use the COVID-19 crisis to accelerate trans sustainability transitions? Are you on the line, perhaps? Andrew is raising his hand, Andrew Rabkin. Oh, I, perfect. I could, offer, I could offer an answer. I'm not, I mean, I mean Go a, ahead. a provocation. I think what's needed, it's Andy Rabkin from the Earth Institute uh, New Communication Initiative. Um, what's needed more than a narrative to me, and I think there's a good case for this, is boosting capacity for community based shaping of sharing and shaping of narratives. There's no one narrative. Anyone who thinks there's one narrative on this planet facing even this crisis is missing the diversity and the implicit diversity around us. So, so what are the platforms and processes that can foster um, progress amid multiple narratives seems to me to be a prime um, responsibility. Excellent. A Andrew, Thank can you. you follow up quickly on that and just give us a couple examples of how different communities can be brought together in the narrative? Well, I just just yesterday on Twitter, there was a very interesting discussion emerging around um, uh, under provisioning or over provisioning uh, hospital beds. Uh, Japan has, uh, uh, what is it, uh, 12.8 per thousand population. The United States is 2.8. 
in, in a crisis like this, you would say, okay, you know, 2.8 is completely screwed up, but making the decision about how many hospital beds is the appropriate number uh, for different countries, different contexts is, is a values decision. It's not, it's not technocratic. There's no single answer. So that's why implicitly there has to be a forum. There are forums like this. The Jefferson Center has uh, long for decades run these uh, uh, citizen juries. France right now is using citizen jury model for uh, shaping its climate policy, uh, at least they were. And that's a very different approach to some of the top-down uh, efforts that I think uh, can't hold up in this kind of a, especially now online, as we all, uh, what we want is a chorus here that it's diverse and variegated and directional. And the directions are shaped by common values, a common purpose, but uh, with variegated outcomes, uh, depending on certain situations. Great. Thanks a lot. I see two more people want to kind of contribute to this idea of narratives. I'm going to go to Patrick and then I'll come to Miriam. Okay. Go ahead, Patrick. Oh, yes. Hello, sir. Um, thanks, Stephen. On the narrative, I wanted to add, I think um, what we see now is that many countries are falling back very much onto finding national solutions. And it's again, a crisis for multilateralism. And this could also impact uh, sustainability transitions. So on the one hand, obviously we need to acknowledge all the local narratives, the multitude of this. Um, at the same time, we need to keep this also as, as a global narrative that requires international cooperation. And also linked to this, we need to think about the governance mechanisms that we need to enable this on a global level rather than, yeah, countries become inward looking, trying to find solutions. Great, thanks, Patrick. Miriam, real quick, go ahead. Yep, I just wanted to respond also to the question of narratives. I agree that there are many that we need, but I think one that we as a sustainability transitions community should really push is the idea that, um, you know, just make making sure that the public, so to speak, um, is aware of the fact that there's a sustainability component to this crisis. This isn't just some virus that randomly mutated and like this is not just a random event. Um, loss of biodiversity seems to have contributed to this situation and also um, what you talked about at the beginning about how the level of globalization, the supply chains that are connected and so on, how all of that has a strong impact on the level that this crisis is taking on. And so um, it's maybe a way to get uh, more and more people behind the idea that something needs to change and that this is an opportunity to make those changes uh, and really you know, make, make sure that we don't just go back to business as usual afterwards. That's a great, that's a really, really great point. Um, there are some questions in the online questions page that are talking about ethics um, and values. Um, I'm gonna go to Bipap Shi Gosh. Um, you posted a question would you like to share your reflections on what changes in our beliefs and practices um, that we might anticipate in response to COVID-19? Deepapshi, are you there? Hmm. Perhaps not. It's a great question, too bad. Um, but there was a number of questions about the sort of ethical implications. Um, does anybody have an answer? Raise your hand. I mean, we can, if you do have, um, you know, something to say regarding something that's being discussed, kind of throw it in the chat box or raise your hand if you'd like as well. Well, I did notice that Ann Stevenson mentioned about that ethical question. Ann, would you like to share some of um, your thoughts on Perfect. that? Ann, are you there? I don't want to put her on the spot. This was this was an issue that came up amongst the number of uh, different okay. sources uh, talking about the sensitivity. Oh, it mm -hmm. wasn't your question, but you mentioned that that was an important issue. So if you'd like to share, you're more than welcome to. Maybe I thought it was an important question, except we can go on to another one, Steve. We can move on. Um, 
Well, let's see. There's a number of really good ones. The most popular question in the chat box um, or on the page right now concerns the post-COVID economic recovery and how it might hinder sustainability transitions and how we can avoid further kind of power imbalances. Would anybody like to offer some reflections on whether climate change may be put on the back burner as we sort of go back to normal, whatever that might mean? Did somebody raise their hand there? I thought I saw Vanessa. Vanessa, Vanessa Timmer, why don't Hi, you go everyone. ahead? Hi. Thanks. Great, thanks. So from the, hi everyone from Vancouver, Canada, from One Earth is my nonprofit and Utrecht University. Um, yeah, I just wanted to reflect on both this and the ethical dimension. I think this COVID crisis being, as everyone's mentioning, deep, experienced deep, in deeply different ways by different communities. And um, some, and you know, uh, I think there was one article on Treehugger that said, we're all living a 1.5 degree lifestyle now. And it was kind of celebrating the fact that because of these rapid shifts, um, there is a reduction in flights and all the things that we've been discussing today. I think the challenge of um, making that, uh, making this as the key way to the transition towards hello, hello. Uh, sustainable uh, footprints. Oh, uh, we've got Francois coming on, I think by phone. Um, you might want to mute yourself, Francois. Um, and uh, basically, the um, I think the problem is that, that we end up uh, not acknowledging the, the ways in which this uh, is actually causing great anxiety amongst people and that this is, as the Global Footprint Network, not what we intended, those of us on the call, really wanting a sustainability transformation. Of course, we can measure the impact of these changes, but I think tying ourselves too closely to it ca causes real uh, problems when we start to celebrate the fact that this is happening. So instead what we can talk about is some of the solutions that might be the seeds of this transformation. And I'll just give you one example that I noted in the cards. Uh, this is being deeply, um, there's a different, uh, there's a gendered implication to the COVID crisis. And as many of us um, uh, have studied as well, of course, there's a gendered implication to the sustainable consumption and production systems. Uh, we have a real opportunity to measure and analyze that. Sure, there's a difference with women and men in terms of their physical response to the COVID crisis, but what this is doing is revealing the, uh, the often invisible care economy that has subsidized the paid economy in such a critical way. And um, we can really uh, use this uh, COVID crisis as a way of revealing the burden of care of the of children and the elderly, how most uh, single parent families are single mothers, um, the the fact that the uh, often the burden of care goes on to the woman because of lower income. So the husband often in the family continues working while the um, as children move home during the self isolation, they end up being the ones who are sacrificing their work. We know in past like SARS crises that that gendered uh, return to the income levels um, is slower for women. And also girls often don't return to education if the schools are closed. So I just wanted to put a pitch to all of us as we talk about COVID, let's look at the gendered implications because these can also be the seeds, for example, of revealing the care and supporting women as we move forward. So I think this ethical dimension can our here it's breaking up for me. No, I think Vanessa made an excellent point, and there was a lot of positive response in the group chat as well. So that's fantastic. Thank you. I think um, Deborah Rowe had also raised her hand. Would you like to say something on this topic or around the question that we posed earlier, Deborah? Uh, yeah, I, sure, I would. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. Thanks for all the participants for joining. So I'm Deborah Rowe, and I run the U.S. Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development. And we're very interested in creating uh, connections between those who want to work on real-world projects 
around sustainability with those who are the practitioners at the front lines and have those projects that need to be worked on. So we've created a free um, system. It's a platform like a matching matchmaking. So go look at projectsthatmatter.com, or excuse me, projectsthatmatter.org. And if you've got ideas for projects, especially those that can be done virtually, we have you know, all of these masters and PhD students and also those in undergraduate and pro bono professionals who want to work on creating a sustainable future, who want to connect with you. So this need to better connect higher ed and also those of us who are volunteers who want to be pro bono volunteers to the practitioners who are on the edge of creating the solutions for the SDGs, um, let's just go ahead and do it as much as we can virtually now and then uh, adding the face-to-face -face as, as time allows and the virus allows. Um, secondly, as we share our narratives, I'm a practical idealist. I'm a fourth generation activist who's also an academic. Um, it's very important that we not just put out visions, but we include in there examples of what's already working. There's these beautiful examples of how human beings are with are in collaboration with each other to create a sustainable future. And telling those stories um, embedded in the vision, connecting it to how do I get involved really makes that narrative come to life. So I would Great. just suggest that we do those things. And I look Fantastic. forward to hearing from others. Thank you, Deborah. And it was projects that matter.org. That's right. And that's Thank just one. You. you can also look at our take actions under uspartnership.org where um, someone took videos of people being change makers in their communities. Those stories Great. are compelling. And that's what we want, a compelling vision with realistic examples of what you can create, uh, connected to resources, of how, you know, informational resources of how to create it so that people can move on this, not just be inspired by this. Fantastic, thank you so much. That's mm -hmm. like a great offer and we can make sure that we have that to follow up afterwards at the end, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to another question. Kate Power um, on the Zoom chat had some comments about the constraints of home working. This gets back to um, some of the gender issues, especially around mothers, around parents with kids at home. Um, this might have connected back with the idea that uh, Philip initially brought up around ideas of well being and being at home. Kate, are you on the line? Hello, I'm here. Nice to see you all. Thanks, um, I was just saying, and, and hi, Philip. I was just saying, um, uh, being careful not to romanticize the staying at home part. I, I agree, do. there's parts of it that I absolutely love, spending more time with my family. Um, but my comment was that um, now I'm also a teacher of second grade and a kindergarten teacher, as well as trying to keep up. I'm also a freelancer, so I'm under that pressure. And um, yeah, I was also saying that um, the burden of um, teaching the children in the world that I'm in anyway, seems to fall more on the women, even though they're also working at home as well. And the men tend to be <laughs> on a generalization. Oh, the, the kids will be fine, you know, let them have a holiday. Um, so there's, I mean, that's just anecdotal. That's obviously not a survey and every family is gonna be different, um, but it's, it's great to spend more time together at home as a family and it's pretty stressful trying to do several things at the same time as well. Great, thank you, Kate. Yes. Um, this is a really good point. And I, I think we could go talk a lot about how we're all coping with uh, family life at home. Katya, good to see Katya. You have raised your hand. Would you like to contribute a bit? Um, sure. sure. Hi. Thanks. Oh, sorry, we, we have two. Oh, sorry. Which one were you? We'll asking? get the next Katya. Well, there's two of you. I'm sorry. I'm Katya, happy to pass. <laughs> go ahead and, and yes, we'll go to the next. I don't know if my video is showing, but I want to um, draw people's attention to, to the fact that 
Um, I'm currently based in France and we're all under lockdown. And I've heard the statistics that only 30% of French workforce is able to work from home, which puts us in a rather privileged position compared to um, those who must be physically present to go to work. And those who are currently actually vulnerable, more vulnerable than us to the crisis. So as part of the ethical discussions um, I'm, I'm really passionate. I want to talk about parenting at home and staying in quarantine with kids, but I also would like to um, raise attention and, and really speak about those people who have no other choice but to work or who are going to lose their jobs because of the crisis and how, um, how can transition towards sustainability take those kinds of work into account because for now, I really hear a kind of a higher level of discussion, which is relevant for maybe 30% of people who can work from home, digital transition and everything, but most of us aren't able to work from home. So how do we deal with that? And how do we accommodate that kind of work in the future? Great point. Thank you, Katya. Can we go to the other Katya, Katya Brunjes? Yes, there? yes, I'm here. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, I'm based at the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University. And I had posed a question that goes back to Deborah Rowe's comment and Susie Moses comment as well. How can we right now support those people who are actually already thinking about devising change by you know, drawing flexibly on all the expertise and the wisdom that's embedded in this network and it's becoming very clear. For example, I'm working with our local city and they are already now thinking how they cannot only provide emergency response to their local businesses, but knowing that the majority of businesses are small and medium sized, that they go quickly out of business um, after four to six days of inaction, how can they use this moment now to really invest in a regenerative economy? And so I was approached with this question and we are trying to set up a team, but I think my point is twofold. People, so my past research showed that these change agents emerge very quickly in an emergency. And we see them in grassroots, we see them in local government, we see them in state departments, we see them in the business and industries, etc. But the point is often we don't see them because we are not part of their networks or communities yet. So how can we really become aware who, who is trying to make change and let them know that we exist and then you know, very quickly create a team drawing on this network to provide evidence supported expertise as Deborah was saying, we have visions and we have shared visions, but can we um, draw on our research and provide this quickly? Um, because people need, you know, daily, they have their COVID-19 calls on a variety of issues. Um, and can we be as quickly in providing um, really rigorous information and engage in transdisciplinary research collaborations? Fantastic. You identified so many important points and questions moving ahead, and especially about the speed. Um, and I think that looking at a number of the questions here, moving on to um, one of the more popular ones is on this discussion about the government stimulus um, in many countries and how this might be channeled towards of green investments and sustainability transitions. I wondered if there's anybody out there would like to share any reflections on how that might be achieved? Somebody raising their hand? Actually, I see Haldra, you have your hand raised. I don't know if you wanted to talk about something. I, I did, I wasn't on that. So um, I just oh, wanted to make a, yeah. a case for the need to diversify this, this community of people especially if you want to deal with some of the ethical implications. I think that becomes a lot easier if you have a diverse group of people in the leadership. Great, thanks. Thanks for making that point. Um, I think maybe on the question that I just mentioned about the stimulus and everything, Oksana Mont actually had a question about what we might be able to learn from the recovery after the 2008 crisis that we can apply now. Um, what needs to be different? Oksana, are you on the call? Yeah, I am on two calls. <laughs> now it's a matter of multitasking. We have a teaching forum at the same time. Um, yeah, no, I, I remember. I'm old enough to remember the 2008 crisis where we were full of hopes 
you know, now is the, the time for the new Green Deal and so on. And then we were kind of uh, watching the, the curve, consumption curves going down. And then, you know, one year after the crisis was kind of over, everything peaked again. And we're again on the same trajectory. So I'm, I'm feeling that what can we learn from this? What have we done wrong? Uh, so that we do not reinvent the wheel, but kind of build on something. Um, and I don't have any solutions. And to be honest with you, I'm really lo <laughs> losing hope. Um, but I still think, I mean, there are historical lessons we can learn. I remember we were working with uh, Kate Power on, on a couple of projects together, looking back at the, at the world war and how you can um, uh, create awareness and incentivize and mobilize population for change. Then it worked. We now see that the lockdowns are you know, suddenly accepted. Uh, and this uh, huge economic, um, not crisis, but economic lockdowns and slowdown of economy is sort of accepted. And at the same time, you know, some days before, uh, population didn't accept uh, that we need to invest 1% uh, of GDP into uh, environmental transition. So clearly, behavioral change can happen overnight, and we need to capitalize on the existing knowledge from the history. Yeah, I think this is a, a, a huge um, issue. And I mean, we don't want to lose hope because the 2008 uh, crisis, we didn't see much change at all. And so um, this is a big one, I think. If anybody has any reactions um, to this sort of challenge or, uh, or question, really, really, really pertinent question, um, I see someone has raised their hand. They, oh, but now they've taken it down. I wanted to say Nedanya, were you there? Do you want to go ahead, Nedanya? Hello, yes. Thank Hello. you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think I'm just uh, going to, to put on my microphone. Is that okay? I hope it's okay. Um, so I'm Nediana from Indonesia. I'm working at the Ministry of National Development Planning. Um, right now, our government is actually make a, re a budget revocation that is uh, prioritizing the COVID-19, um, COVID-19, COVID-19 to tackle the COVID-19. But and I, I concern with the question that uh, I'm worried that the post COVID-19 that the government priority will change into another um, problem such as. Um, the GDP or any other. So if you guys maybe have an, any ideas or comment about how the government can keep going to prioritize and make the focus of the budget to the sustainability transition. Thank you. Great, that's a really good point. Um, we don't know the answers to all these questions, I think. And I had, Another um, nice question. I think I finally see a person that we tried to ask um, to get involved earlier. Bipap Shigosh, are you there? You had a nice question on how beliefs and practices might change, but you had another um, nice question about deep changes that we can anticipate in our beliefs and practices post COVID-19 crisis and what those impacts might have on sustainability transitions. Yes, yes, I'm here. Sorry, uh, sorry about yeah, earlier. Um, yeah, so I, I just, I mean, this is part of my, uh, immediately the research that I'm doing uh, in the UK at the University of Sussex. Uh, yeah, so I'm involved in this project on deep, we're looking at deep transitions. And that kind of allows me to think about, you know, how do we change deeper rules? So deeper beliefs and deeper practices. So in a sense, you can look at different practices that we are embracing at the moment. Uh, we are changing our practices of how we work, how we shop, um, how we kind of balance between work and life. So I think these are the kind of changes that we are quickly and swiftly adopting. Uh, so I wonder, I mean, this is a question obviously to all of you. Uh, I wonder whether we can 
whether we can reflect on what this means, what these changes mean for longer term, to what extent these changes are sustainable, because I also heard discussions around, uh, you know, difficulties on adjusting or uh, not to over, uh, over fancy the idea of homeworking, which I am also kind of partly agree with, um, and also the kind of gender issues uh, related to this. So, so I do see kind of challenges associated to it. So I, I do have, uh, so I think I'll kind of keep that question open uh, for now to, uh, to kind of uh, encourage uh, all of us to think about what these changes that we are experiencing now uh, might uh, or might not be sustainable in the long term. Yeah, that was kind of a broad question, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm very interested and I'm kind of, uh, I think this discussion really, really uh, is helping me as well to think through some of the more specific issues. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, please respond to some of these questions in the chat box and we'll, we'll kind of have to pick up the threads afterwards. I see someone's hand raised, Sasha Nick. Uh, yes. Uh, Go ahead. Can, can you hear me? I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer the previous question, but I have a suggestion to make. Uh, yeah. Right now, every government's focus is on saving lives, and that makes sense. Now, hopefully, three months from now, we, we, we would be out of that phase, and focus could be on rebuilding a, uh, well, picking up the pieces and uh, preparing the future. And the most obvious question will be how to avoid the repeat of such a pandemic. We had three coronaviruses in, in the last 17 years. So if we extrapolate without any, any uh, sophisticated analysis, we'll have another one be before 2030. And that one will be even worse, probably. Uh, so uh, that's probably going to be at least for a year or two on everybody's mind. And that may be an opening to look into what kind of measures will prevent the next uh, pandemic and how those measures will take us already a big step towards sustainability, like reducing short-term travel, uh, disentangling complex supply chains, uh, probably uh, in increasing food sufficiency and many, many other things. And those things alone may perhaps take us 30 or 50% towards a sustainable world. And there is a window of opportunity that may start three months from now and may last a year. And my suggestion would be perhaps we should focus on those measures. And then after they've been enacted, see how can we extend the measures to the other 50% that we wouldn't achieve just by preparing uh, to for the next pandemic and increasing our resilience. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's a good, it's a really good uh, strategy thinking forward here. I wanna get, as time is uh, running out on us, I wanna get a few more comments uh, if possible. Um, there is a great comment by Nico in the Philippines uh, about what measures can be taken so that marginalized communities in the global South will not be put at risk as we emerge from this transition. Nico, are you there on the line? Nico, there? No? Okay, we will have to move on then. I guess there's a couple people that have raised their hands here. I see um, Claudia Santos. Yes, hello. Go ahead. Um, I did ask kind of a similar question. So uh, what would be the spill overs of the decisions that we're making now in the wealthier world? So what would be the spill overs for the global south? It's something that really concerns me. Um, we, we can have um, some, some thoughts of how this will impact aid in the global south. But I also see this as an opportunity to pick up some of the local indigenous practice, practices that have been um, always sustainable, but that we've ignored. And maybe this is um, an opportunity to hear those um, 
voices that have been uh, wanting to be here for such a long time. I work on small island developing states and perception and migration. Um, and I really see it uh, as, as an opportunity for them to try and maybe what, um, what Joseph was talking about, the globalization, you know, um, rather than depending on imports so much, how they can transform themselves, especially when I hear so many times that they do not need the international community around. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to leave that comment. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna go with about two or three more comments. If we can make them shorter, I can get more folks through. Jonas Torrens. Thank you so much. Uh, I was thinking about the fact that we seem to be facing not a single transformation, but rather this multiple competing dynamics of change happening at once. Uh, and I was just listing some of which we discussed. So there seems to be this kind of issues of disruption and reorganization, uh, potentially systems that break down and need to be rebuilt in certain ways or supply chains that need to be reformulated and so forth. But there are also discussions about new routines and becoming normalized and so forth. And I think it would be really useful in the sense making effort if we were, if we were to try and tease out what are those kind of different patterns. Uh, Bipashi just mentioned this kind of deeper norms and, and rules. Uh, so I think trying to identify some of those dynamics of, of change, you know, the stabilization of systems and so forth, um, would be a very useful effort, I suppose. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jonas. Yes, we're going to have to pick up some of these threads uh, after the webinar for sure. Rachel Freeman, are you on? Rachel, are you there? You've raised your hand. Maybe, maybe not. She still has her hand raised there, but perhaps not. I'm gonna go, um, is there Kurt Johannes. Da? Oh, sorry, Joe. Uh, Johannes Kubel has been raising his hand. I don't think he can mm -hmm. be able to get on there. So Johannes, you wanna say something? Perfect. Yeah, sure, thank you for the opportunity. I, yeah, I was thinking of the different uh, measures that uh, can be made now on the economy. And I have a big problem with that, that we are still printing a lot of money to try to recover uh, now all the economy and at least all the big companies as well, uh, because uh, all the power structures won't change after it. And uh, also how we are living um, in this, this destructive economy system would work push it more and I hope we should build alternatives. And so um, we was looking actually all the organizations and platforms that exist now in Germany and Switzerland. And we found so much people already in the sustainable transformation, but what are missing is the connection and the link between each other. And also like a communication platform where we can exchange ideas with different narratives and also to get more aware and raise more awareness about how the system works. And also the, how the finance system works, because if we can rebuild finance systems on a local level, we can also make a better circular economy transition. And so yeah, the project that's what we are doing is called Lightwave. And uh, we are trying to connect now all these organization people. And I hope to, yeah, to, to connect also to you or to more people and organizations to work more together. And yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Um, we are running out of time. Um, and I would like to shift us away from the discussion. I think there's so many other topics and so many great questions and comments that uh, are coming out of the group here. It's going to take us some time to sort of uh, digest them all and get back to you all. But uh, they're fantastic. Let's shift over to the offers and asks. And these are the light blue and the dark blue cards on the uh, online questions page. And I'm just gonna go through the list here. And uh, for those of you whose names I mentioned, if you can just um, give us a 10 second uh, explanation, that would be fantastic. Um, N Kearney would like to call for the development of interactive models that people can play with. N Kearney, I don't know if you are a man or a woman, go ahead. Hi, hi, can you hear me fine? Hi, my name is Norman. I'm from the University of Waterloo. So, of course, people are anxious about the pandemic on two levels, at least the health level and the economy level. 
when people are anxious, they tend to either double down on their existing beliefs or question them and search for something new. As many people have already mentioned in the past few weeks, you see a lot of things previously impossible are happening. So the status quo no longer needs to be seen as inevitable. But for most people, this is still a temporary interruption and there's a desire to get back to normal. So if this is going to double as an opportunity for renewal, I think we need to show that alternatives are both desirable and feasible. I think the concept of a right. well-being economy bridges the health and economic dimensions. And a great way to approach this would be to use accessible interactive models that explore the implica implications of different policy responses and could help build a perception of the feasibility of a well-being economy. Models could look at things like what would be the implications if governments continued income supports like a basic income, or can we have health and well-being without GDP growth or with less GDP growth? And what does that look like? Thank you. Great, fantastic, thank you. There was a, um, a comment on here that said, there are calls for the academic community to commit to less travel, here, here. Uh, I'm gonna keep listing these off. Offer to access or offer of an access to databases for organizations working toward SDGs. So there's a, a way to coordinate around uh, data and databases, that's excellent. There's an offer from Kay Ellsworth Krebs to join a project about sharing best practices on a new virtual conference format. Are you there? Kay Ellsworth Krebs, real quick. Perhaps not. There was, if you are, just to jump in, offers to of a platform to match make relationships between practitioners and researchers who want to work on applied projects. That sounds a lot like the, um, the website that Deborah was mentioning there as well. Um, there's another one that says, ask for help in understanding the role of crowdsourcing. That's Jonas. Um, Did you yes. want to say something really quickly? Oh, um, I'm sharing a link there. You can see it. Uh, yesterday, I tried to put together just a spreadsheet to try and unpack uh, and list some of the claims that are being made about the relationship between Corona and sustainability transformations. Uh, there's been quite right. a few articles on political RSA and so on. Uh, and it would be interesting if more people were to contribute. If you're interested in contributing to filling the, the spreadsheet, please send me a direct message. If not, if you just want to comment on the existing questions, feel free to do so and we'll share them as soon as that is a bit more robust. Great, fantastic. Yes, help out Jonas with that link on crowdsourcing. Um, Marlene is asking for help in combining studies of consumption with human well-being. Marlene. Yes, hi everybody. Actually, we um, a, a few of us got together a few academics teaching courses this semester and we are proposing to have our students reflect on how coronavirus is changing their consumption, but also making the link to well being. So I'm sort of echoing what has already been said on this call about the need to have more of a uh, reflective discussion about what all of this means in terms of basic human needs. So access to health is one of them, but also social contact, contact with nature, you know, very high level. Uh, registers of well-being that also help people distinguish needs which are often satisfied by material uh, consumerism as we know and well-being which at this time is actually being uh, constrained in many ways for a number of people so we're starting a teaching initiative as of next week to try and get our students to engage with this um, Francis Fahi is involved others are involved that are on this call please reach out to me if you're interested in joining. Fantastic, thank you so much, Marlene. Robert Weiss is asking for forming a group to support decision makers for crisis preparation. Robert, real quick. Yeah, hello, um, thanks for doing this. Uh, so I was wondering as to whether we can form a group uh, to help uh, decision makers to take more proactive steps uh, for me, as someone who studies disasters, it's really dumbfounding to see how late decisions were made and then how uh, uh, interruptive, interruptive the decisions have to be or interventions have to be. So I wonder if you can, uh, in this transition that we are in and the leverage that might exist right now, uh, can we create a group of people who can help decision makers uh, to be more proactive to begin with or convince them to be more proactive? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Robert. A couple more. We're, there's an ask for collaborators on a project to explore how the automotive industry might respond. And there are other industries, of course. 
the chat box comments already point to textiles and food. So there's, this was another one that came up before we started the webinar is perhaps we could follow up with different themes or areas that we could sort of go to and those that are interested in those areas could collaborate together. Let's do that. We can do that with the follow up. Also, one more ask for people to get together to discuss social imaginary and how the universe of realistic ideas uh, is getting bigger. Um, the idea of discussing social imaginary would be another kind of topical area, I think, as well. That's fantastic. I want to just call on Siona Candy. You had your hand raised. Before One we wrap second. Stuff up. Siona, go for it's it. coming in here. Go ahead. Hi. Um, just beware, I have a four-year-old in the background. So he's watching a movie, but sometimes he gets a little excited. Um, uh, so I want to go back to this comment about reducing travel. So, um, which, sorry, which applies to um, not just uh, sort of sustainability, but also this sort of post-pandemic world. But there's a lot of calls for this from people who are already established academics, right? But those of us who are early career researchers, how can this network support yeah. early career researchers and PhDs and everyone to build their networks in a different way? So those who are in a position of security, yeah. who already have networks, how do they share networks with those of us who don't, may not have the opportunity to build the networks in the same way? What other things can we do? It also, it's really applicable. I'm also a mother. So I, for a number of years, I, I couldn't travel. So this is not a new issue at people who are disabled. There's an accessibility issue. This is, I suppose, a, a, a equity issue. Um, so it'd be really great if there were any ideas um, yeah. uh, in this group for how to facilitate that networking without flying. I'm going to, I, I have somebody who I know was on the call that might have something to say. Yost, do you have anything to say on this? Regarding the- I was, I was sorry, I was a bit busy responding to an ocean of messages that I got uh, as a response to a, a call I did in the, in the question, but sorry, I, I was sort of half listening. This was also sorry, about sorry. The, the precariousness Fiona. of PhDs. Yes, and how early career folks who now don't want to travel can sort of get exposure and build their career without the kind of burden of travel. You have one option or idea that I know the Slack is. Um, yeah, we have we have a big international Slack about uh, around anticipatory governance and sustainability, where we have hundreds of people uh, that that I'm offering for people to sort of have as a replacement for network building. And I think uh, I think. Uh, I was tweeting about this the other day, but I think that as sort of, sort of mid-career or senior researchers, people can really do a lot of work to to just put in some time to to, to uh, spread or spread the um, you know the work of early career researchers, get them in touch with everybody. If we can put, all put in a little bit of time for this, that would help. And setting up more of these networks and conversations would really help because for some of us, this is great to be involved in, but not maybe not, you know essential to our careers. But for early career researchers, it really is. So I agree. I'll have more thoughts about that later, but uh, yeah. Hey, everybody, we've gone on for 90 minutes, um, and the response has been overwhelming. I think uh, we're going to try to. Stephen, we can't hear you. Now we really can't hear you. Okay, try it again, Stephen. We've lost your sound. <laughs> All right, um, a little bit. We can hear you just barely. <laughs> it's a divine there, intervention. That's better. It's a, oh, it's a signal that time is up. Okay, maybe. Okay, Stephen. What do you, can you type into the chat at least, Stephen? What you were trying to say? trying to finish oh. up here um yell so, yell into the thing we can hear you barely no right again can you hear Joe, me why now? don't you wrap it up okay um trying to wrap this up yeah go ahead steven can you yell into the th to the phone okay guys hopefully you can hear um 
we just like to follow up in the next few days. Um, there's so much stuff that, you know, ideas and everything that people have been uh, contributing. We'll kind of uh, get back to you on this. A recording of the open forum will be made available online for others to see. So pass the word about that. We anticipate a number of ways to follow up together, including additional webinars or other collaborations. So we'll pass the word around regarding those endeavors. If you're interested in some of the discussions today about sustainable consumption production, visit our Knowledge Action Network page online at futureearth.org. We are more than happy to connect you with working groups and have more information on SCP. Uh, join the Future Earth Open Network if you haven't already. And on behalf of all the conveners, uh, we appreciate your participation tonight. And we hope that you and your loved ones are healthy. And